Uh, that's effectively all we're going to do for, for the old copper stuff. Um, didn't touch on WLR. It's just the services of years and years and years. And uh, the basics of the, the DSL and the NGA troubleshooting will apply. It's just basically how do, you reassign, how do you read your line tests? Is there a fault with CPA? If so, remove all the CPA and then test without. Does that fault remain without CPA? If so, is it a minor or a major? If minor, test CPA. If major, move forward with fault. So fiber to the home troubleshooting. What we've done here is we have We've reduced a lot of the jargon in our previous FTTH troubleshooting slides, and we've we've kind of uh, we filled them out with with more basic kind of slides with, with less jargon, which I think will go down significantly better. So, just a really quick overview of the FTT network. So, it's it's a fiber service. We don't use any cable in here. Light is transmitted via network cabin from the exchange to the customers from the customer's premises to provide the service. Uh, this is our optical distribution frame, which feeds from the exchange via underground cabling out into the network. It then fed up onto the polling into a DP, then goes along serving different DPs as it goes. Now, it doesn't all have to be overhead. This can be a combination of overhead and underground uh, until it gets to the final termination point. And the way Fiber to the Home works is if, let's, let's number these DPs, one, two, three, four, and five, if if five goes down, four, three, two, and one will still work. If four goes down, three, two, one will still work. If three goes down, two and one will still work. And if two goes down, one will still work. So it's if the cable goes the further out, the customers behind that cable will still still stay live. Uh, the only test that we can run against the fiber to the home to help us troubleshoot is a synchronization test. So we'll go through that now in a few moments. And um, if you do have the option to run a line test. So your copper test, your metallic test, as well as a sync test, it means that the customer has a PSDN connection. So for fiber to the home, we actually do see it quite commonly where the, we'll get uh, fiber to the home network in major foreign DCV with and without CPA. So uh, my team will know straight away that that's invalid. We know that there's no copper testing done against fiber to the home. So that's an instant reject. We'll send it back for further clarification. And uh, we log our faults based on alarm codes. So might be a bit of a terminology mix up there. So in, in internally, we call these alarm clouds on the false team, but uh, externally, they're called last down causes. So we, we, we'd find your lossy, your low fi and your dying gasp alarms within your sync test. Uh, this is a photo I got from a lab setup. So just so you have a picture of what way it works. This is our optical NTU. So this is the termination point for uh, the fiber network. This then sends the, the fiber signal via the patch cable into the NTU, or ONT, I should say. The ONT then converts the optical signal into an electrical signal and then sends this back over via Ethernet cable into the modem via the WAN port. And then the modem converts it into a digital signal, which can then be used by uh, by uh, the, the PC. So naturally, it's always it's not going to always be this easy. You know, customer might have four TVs, seven cats, and you know, God knows whatever else. The modem could be up on, a, on top of a shelf. It can be quite difficult to determine. But, this is the layout that would always go go optical NTU to ONT to modem. Um, so just a quick screen capture of the ONT itself. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out here, we get a lot of LAN failures based on blinking LAN lights. It's just assumed that it's not working. And blinking LAN light means that there is data being transferred, and it is indeed working. LAN on is that it's just an active connection, but there's nothing being transferred at that moment in time. And then off is when you'd start looking for failed LAN connections. So I just stress that blinking does indeed mean that data is being transferred. It's it's not an error. Uh, power, green is, is a standard that's powered on. Orange, um, I, I haven't actually gotten an orange fault in yet on the power, but it basically means that it, the ONT itself is running off its backup, power, backup battery. Um, if you do see an orange light, just log a fault straight to it. So uh, you power down the ONT, log it as ONT not responding due to the dying gas plan, turn it back on and let us know that it's on an orange power light and we'll dispatch a tech up. And we have our LAN, our loss, our pawn, and our power. So FTTH sync tests looks slightly different to the other one. There's less information on it, but it's more to the point. We have our customer MAC address. So this needs to be connected up correctly for us to see the customer's MAC address. If it's not connected in the WAN and it goes through ports one to four, you're just your standard Ethernet ports, we won't see the MAC, um, which can misdiagnose an issue if it's not set up correctly. We'll get a technician out, they'll walk in, they'll remove the cable, they'll plug it into where it needs to go in the modem, and then they'll charge the customer because it's a failed truck road, should have been handled on call. 
one thing to be clear of of the Mac is uh, sometimes the last, the very, 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 very last digit can look different. If it does look, uh, if it's only the last digit that looks different, it's grand. It's just whatever way the modem has picked it up, it's assigned a port to uh, the Ethernet, and the last, the last digit will differ depending on on where it's connected into the the back of the modem. So if you connect into one of your Ethernet ports, or if you connect it into the WAN port, the last digit should be different. Uh, the ONT serial number. So. If you if you ever run a sync test and you see the serial number has F F F F F F, it means there's no serial number on it. Give ourselves a bell with the serial number from the back of the ONT and we'll add it on. No need for a fault in that instance. It's a quick fix. Uh, we recently got all the lad systems upgraded to allow them to do it themselves, so they don't need to go through me anymore. So uh, what that means is that you won't be put on hold while they come. They can they can literally just do it there if you uh, there and then, which makes it a faster turnaround. Another thing to kind of keep an eye out here is that all serial numbers start with 4A57543 and are hexadecimal, so dealing with A to F, so uh, base 16. So if you ever see anybody give the first eight digits that don't match what I've just said, or if they, they're using letters, let's say G or P, um, you know instantly that they're giving you the wrong information and you can push back. Uh, last down cause is going to be uh, what we refer to as alarms, and it lets us know the, the reason why the ONT lost signal the last time. Uh, lossy, low fi and um, dying gas for the main ones that we see. Uh, received power, so this is the power that actually the customer gets on their end. So this is minus 20.6, so it's not 2060, sometimes it can be misdiagnosed. So what you do here is you can divide by 100 or you just move the decimal point over two. So yeah, uh, you do minus two, zero, pop your decimal point in. And uh, that'll give you the value. So if, if that was minus one, two, eight, oh, that would be minus 12, eight. Uh, that would be 12, minus 12.80, 12 um, not minus 12,800, 12, just, just a heads up on it. Uh, power level is the same for all packets. Uh, port status just lets us know if it's up or down. This is the profile. So Profiles and Fiber at home work slightly different than than the other ones. We, with ADSL or, or NGA, you'll you'll kind of put a customer on a profile range. So if you take ADSL, for example, you could be up between eight and twenty-four. So that gives you the facility to then move that customer up and down profiles as you need. Fiber at home, though, it's all done through an order. So the customer, if they want to move up a profile, you can't just do you know, profile change order anymore. You need to actually change the customer, the product the customer is going for and get the higher the higher profile product. So if you want to go for a gig, you can't just, yeah, do a profile change and put them on a gig. You need to actually place an order to upgrade the customer service from the 150 to the 1000 and vice versa if you want to downgrade. Uh, current pro profile cannot be changed. Packet can only be upgraded or downgraded via orders. Uh, this effectively is what you'll see when you're going to log them. So I do, I do need to stress uh, that the default codes are very important. Now, what we're seeing at the moment is about a 50-50 reject rate on Fiber to the Home because of either the incorrect default codes are being used or we're just not seeing any notes or we're seeing troubleshooting that is basically troubleshooting multiple issues but no, no singular issue identified. So um, I, have to, I have to make it very clear to you all though, but we're seeing an awful lot of slow speeds coming in that have no relation to slow speeds and fiber to the home to get around the UG's guard. Um, they are instant rejects. So it's just a head office. If we open a fault and it says no slow slow speeds in the fault code and we open up and it says no sync, that's, that's rejected instantly. So I know some people might struggle and want to get a fault through, but at the end of the day, it's only going to cause more hassle because that customer is then going to call in looking for an update on their fault. You'll have to tell them it was rejected because it wasn't logged correctly. So. Just keep bear in mind, it's 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 literally it's causing a massive, massive split in the acceptance and reductions. So we'll go through it now. Intermittent drops you can use with low fi alarms, or if you're seeing reoccurring lossy alarms, low speeds to the customer should only be used for slow speeds. Um errors on the line should be used if you're having anything with um, authentication issues. Uh, power light off can be used for when it's down as DJ to let us know that there's no power to the ONT. A lot of the time we get these in as ONT not responding, though, which is no problem with that either. As long as the, the ONT not responding code relates to the actual issue, we'll accept it. And um, pawn light off and pawn light flashing. So another thing just to, to clarify here is 
we're seeing an awful lot of lossy faults come through as pawn faults. And the reason the pawn flashes when you get a lost connection is that it has no way to confirm the serial number back through the exchange because of the cable break. So your pawn light should be flashing, but you should also have a red LOS light flashing below the pawn. So in that instance, if you do have a red LOS light and the pawn, uh, the, the LOS light would take priority and we would screen as a lossy fault, not a pawn fault. Um, it's always good to keep your, your fault codes correct because if you look for a report and you want to say, okay, how many lossy faults have we had this year? How many slow speed faults have we did this year? If they're being used, if the, if the correct codes aren't being used on the faults, then when you pull that report, it will always be incorrect. Uh, loss of signal, loss light permanently or loss light flashing. These are just for LOS faults. Uh, either one of them is perfect. Um, you can send them through. Lossy is just going to indicate a cable break, whether it's solid or permanently flashing. So we're good to go there. Uh, land light off. This one is one that you need to be careful with. What can happen is there can be a LAN alarm that gets sent through the back end of the system, which will allow you to use the LAN light off. However, there's also hardware fail the failure within the ONTs, which won't actually pick up that the LAN is failing, even though it is a LAN failure. And in that instance, what you just do is you power it down, choose ONT not respond because you generate a dying gas alarm, and then power back on the ONT. You send it through for ourselves. Uh, the majority of faults will get appointments as well. So if you have a dead ONT, or if you have a rogue ONT, or your patch cable internally is damaged, they all get open for appointments. So always just kind of keep an eye on what fault you're loading. And if it will be an appointment, uh, just keep an eye on it. Generally go back to about 40 minutes, we've screened it and we've sent it back. Uh, fiber wall outlet can be used for, let's say the customer is taking over a new premises. And what we see an awful lot is that the older customer, when they're sending back their modem, will actually send back the ONT and the modem to the previous provider they were with. So in that instance, you just log a, a fault and let us know that the previous tenant has removed the, the ONT. Uh, we'll check to see if it's been active uh, in the recent period, time period. And if it is, we'll push it back for further checks. And if, if it, the time frames match up, uh, we'll, we'll push them. And we'll get a technician out there, we'll install it. Uh, NGA install failed only to be used within the first 30 days of um, a full install fault or a full install order. I uh, generally don't see many of them on fiber to the home. Uh, you know, the main thing causing fiber to the home to fail would be the, the serial number doesn't come across correctly. So, you know, you can just give us a bell then and we can add it on directly. The main cause of NGA failed installs would be splicing issues. So where the fiber cable is spliced incorrectly to and, you know, customer should be on port 1.1, .1, but it's actually coming up under port 1.3. So that would be the main cause of failed installs. And thankfully, we haven't seen a lot of them in the last year or two. So it's kind of as the network kind of grows and kind of becomes more stable, then kind of errors are being ruled out, it's going to become a thing of the past. And then just down the bottom, it is imperative that the correct, report code, the, the correct report code is used when logging a fault and that all questions are correctly answered to ensure an efficient resolution of the issue. Um, I should also advise that the, the main reason I'm stressing that, the, one of the main reasons I'm stressing the correct fault code needs to be used is that that actually dictates how that fault routes through our system. So if you use the incorrect fault code, the fault might be dispatched and you know, it might go to a team who have nothing to do with what the actual issue is that you're looking to get fixed. Uh, so last down cause. So example of the main FTDH alarms are last down causes. So LDC or alarms, last down cause refers to the reason for the last loss of signal and indicates why the broadband dropped the last time the ONT was offline. So the main was to get was lossy. It's uh, short for loss of signal. Alarm indicates that a cable break or disconnection has occurred on the external line or that the patch cable is disconnected within the premises. Lossy alarms are nice and simple. You just you, you effectively verify that there's no cable break within the premises and that lets us know that it has to be outside the home. And we just dispatch a tech as long as you've confirmed that the patch cable has been secure. If the patch is not confirmed to be secure, we'll push it straight back for that information. Um, Lo-fi is loss of frames. So this is intermittent sync um, between the network and the ONT. So low fire loss of frames alarms indicate frames are dropping resulting in intermittent sync. We could we generally identify this by the RX optics value and generally be very low, so sub minus 30. So you're talking minus 30 to minus 33 is generally the range we see these come in. You can get low fi at a lower range. And if we ever see a low fi alarm, we will accept it without any problems. Um, it'll need a tech to ground and figure out what's causing the frames to drop. It just needs to be valid. It needs to be a recent alarm. I'll, I'll, I'll explain more about that now in a few. And dying gas alarm is the one that we'll see the most. So this dying gas was power down or power loss, mains power loss. 
So DG alarm indicating ONT has been powered down. This can be caused by the customer bowing down the ONT or ONT power failure. So what we do is we go through troubleshooting lossy first. When the customer calls into ourselves, we're going to answer the call. First thing we're going to do is we're going to ask them, and it, this is this will be a golden thing for fiber at home, is always just ask them what lights are on the ONT and making the call out every light that's on it, not just the first one. So agent asks customer what lights are present at the ONT. And then I just put this in because we've seen a few where we're getting modem lights an awful lot of the time. So just please ensure that they check the ONT and not the modem itself. Um, once they confirm that the red loss is present, then we jump into our, our, our lossy troubleshooting. So nice and simple with lossy issues. Customer literally just needs to confirm that the patch cable is secure at both ends, so that it's not falling out with the optical NTU, and that it's connected into the ONT. It's not loose at either part, and it's connected at both parts. Once that's confirmed, we then run a sync test to see what the last alarm is. Um, and if it's lossy, we then just lossy fault, and then our note should be customer has lost like present, uh, patch cable has been checked. That's effectively all we're looking for lossy issues. Um, one thing that I do need to, to kind of throw out there is that we see an awful lot of customers who are replacing modems for customers with lossy issues. So just a heads up, that's never, ever going to resolve the problem, and it's, it's only going to antagonize the customer. So if you do see a lossy issue, it's going to be a network problem. You just need to identify whether it's inside the premises or outside the premises, uh, replacing the modem or something like that in that, in that instance. Um, won't actually assist the, the, the problem. The problem is, is before the modem. Um, a sync test should then be run to identify the alarm code. If a lossy alarm is present on the sync test, the agent then raises the fault using the lossy fault code in UG. If the patch was confirmed secure, the fault will be rooted to a field tech who will check the external line. If the patch was confirmed as damaged loose, the fault will be open for an appointment as the tech will need access to the site. So that's just, if it's outside, we'll dispatch it normally. If there's an issue inside, we'll send it out. Uh, patch cable issues inside the premises aren't too bad. Um, they're, they're normally caused by dogs or children. Uh, they just get a hold of the cable and they, they'll pull them out and they'll break the connector and the, the dogs just, uh, they love the fiber cable and I don't know what it is about them, but they love chewing it. Uh, in some instances, so this is also another one to kind of, that catches a lot of people out. In some instances, what will happen is the customer will confirm that the lost light is present on the ONT, but when you run your sync test, it'll actually say that the last down is a dying gas. So what's after happening here is that the customer, let's say, goes to bed for the night, powers down their ONT, gets up the next morning, powers on the ONT, and they get a red lost light. And what's happening here is when the customer powers down the ONT, it sends a command to the exchange to say, listen, I'm going to sleep goodbye, and we get a dying gas alarm. But when the customer powers on the ONT, if a cable break has occurred throughout the night, the ONT knows that it can't communicate back to the exchange, so it'll throw up a lossy light, but the exchange thinks that the ONT is still asleep because the last command it was received was a successful dying gas alarm. So in that instance, if the customer says that they have a lost light on the ONT, but you get a dying gas result on your sync test, you just log in as ONT not responding due to the dying gas alarm. And then within the notes, uh, something along the lines of lossy during power down, patch cable confirmed secure, perfect note, 10 out of 10, we'll accept that and we'll send it on. So in some instances, the customer confirmed lossy light is present for the ONT, but a dying gas alarm will turn to the sync. Uh, we refer to this as lossy during power down. Uh, this is caused when a cable break occurs when the ONT is powered down, and due to the break occurring during a period when the ONT is powered down, the exchange will have received a DG alarm due to the customer power down, but won't receive the loss alarm. Uh, we troubleshoot with it the same way. We log it as ONT not responding. And for all lossy issues, it is critical that the supplier confirms red loss and the patch cable. So if we don't get that confirmed, um, we will push it back. Now, confirming red loss, effectively using your fault code saying lossy confirms that it's a red loss. However, if it's um, if it's a lossy during power down and we're just told that the patch cable is secure, we will return it for further clarification just to ensure that we are we are sending out for the correct problem. Uh, if the above is not provided, it'll be rejected. Low fi troubleshooting. So same again, customer will call us in. Uh, we ask, we'll ask, the, we, we dig through with the customer to identify what the problem is and the customer will identify that they're having intermittent sync. Uh, we should, when we run the sync test, we should find a low fi alarm present and we should find RX optics uh, very low. Uh, low fi alarm to be verified as current alarm. So this is what I was saying. So if a previous in sync 
fault had happened previously and the customer has active service since the restoration of the service, you may be looking at the previous false alarm. So just to go back and explain this. But you see down here where it has our last down calls and our last down and last uptime. What happens here is if a technician goes out to a lossy problem and fixes that, our low fire arm or dying gasp or whatever it is, when he fixes that, the last down cause will be from the, the alarm and the last uptime will be from when the customer puts that back up into service. So if that customer doesn't have any issues moving forward and doesn't power down the ONT, what the last down cause will do will still track the last down alarm which as the customer moves forward and forward with an active service gets further and further away. So what we can see is a lot of the time you might see a low fire alarm, but it's actually from let's say the fifth of the ninth. And when we check the customer's last uptime, they've been up since the 10th of the ninth and then the current date is the 20th of the ninth, let's say. So in that instance, that alarm is then invalid. It's, it's too far in the past to actually be um, a recent alarm. Uh, we also check the RX optics on the sync test and document as it needs to be added to your supplier notes. So just if you see a low file alarm, you also give us the RX optics on the, on your supplier notes. Uh, intermittent sync fault to be loaded via the UG. Uh, please be aware low file alarms indicate in sync between the exchange and the ONT. So you won't see a low file alarm if the connectivity is dropping between, let's say, a faulty LAN port between the, the ONT and the modem, or if the modem's having any issues picking up the signal and it's dropping a battery for, let's say, a brick modem, uh, we won't get any low file alarm there. The low file alarm will only occur when it's within the network, so but somewhere between the exchange to the customer's um, NTU. It, a low file alarm will only return if the intermittent sync is caused by the network. If the customers have an intermittent service due to hardware side issues, um, you won't get a low file alarm and you'll most likely have to send that through to ourselves as ONT not responding. Um, if the service is dropping between the ONT and the modem, the fault should be loaded as ONT not responding as the sync is not dropping, rather it's a hardware issue either in the modem or the ONT. Uh, as long as there's a valid low file alarm, so you know it's, it's not a week or two back in the past and it's from today, we'll generally accept it, even if the optics aren't in the range that we'll expect them to, we'll still send a technician out to review the line and rule out anything that could be causing the Lofi issue. Uh, we don't support Wi-Fi drops. We're actually seeing a rise in Wi-Fi related faults coming through to ourselves where people are talking about changing SSIDs and resetting passwords and, and the like. Uh, we just don't support them at all. Uh, anything that's Wi-Fi related, uh, you, you would be the experts on that. So it's, it's the vendor modems that you guys are sending out and then you'd be troubleshooting. But a few tips would be, are they falling off the 2.4 into the 5G band? Do they live in a, an older built house with the concrete walls? Um, are they a bungalow? And are their house too big? Do they have decent home plugs or kind of things to look into for that instance? Uh, ONT not power. So ONT no power, yet again, is another really, really, really easy one to, uh, to troubleshoot. So the customer calls in, they confirm there's no light on the ONT. You might laugh, but the first thing you should get them to do is check the ONT power switch. Um, the amount of times we get technicians dispatched into premises and declare notes that they send back to me our customer had ONT power down. So it's, 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 it's kind of down to customer behavior, whether they understand what they need to do or not, or whether you know, they don't want to do it. You know, we might catch them on an off day. But first thing we should always do is get them to check the ONT power switches in the on position. After that, what we do is we make sure that they have it plugged in. So, you know, the, the connector needs to be in the ONT and the plug needs to be on a wall socket. We should never go into an extension lid. Um, you know, we, we can't stop the customers from doing it. But when we're testing it to prove a valid fault, we need to move it from the extension lid back onto a wall socket and verify if the power comes back. And if no power comes at that stage, you need to verify the wall socket has power. Handiest way to do that is just to get a phone charger, plug the phone charger in, get them to stick their phone on it. And if it's charging, you know that socket has electrical power in it. And uh, we can then move forward with um, a no power to ONT fault. So yet again, also logging their ONT not responding. So uh, if customers are unsure, the plug is connected to the ONT in a wall socket extension, they should never be used. The plug into extension, they need to test. Okay, we've gone through that. Uh, if connected to a wall socket, the wall socket switch should also be verified to be in the correct position and proven working. So that's also that's something I forgot to mention. You know the way some of the wall sockets, they have the little power switches on and off. A lot of the time they can be brushed off and uh, they'll just be powered down by mistake. So two on switches and ensure that it's plugged up correctly. Another thing that you know you won't come across often, but we, we've seen, we've actually seen an awful lot of it in rural Ireland is 
that people are using powered switches. So you're like extension needs that you plug into the wall and they have a circle around the plug and you can set what time they work to to what time they don't, they'll stop working at. Uh, you know, the, the, the wife or the husband might put them in and then the, the partner then calls into you guys uh, unaware that they actually have them online. So that was another big driver of fail faults that we found was uh, the, uh, the timed extension needs and the, the timed plug sockets. Uh, when the above is complete and the ONT remains with no power, an ONT respondent fault should be loaded and the supplier notes confirm both the ONT power switches in the on position and that the socket the ONT is connected to has been verified as working. As long as them two pieces of information there uh, have been placed in the notes, we'll then push the fault out. Uh, with no power to ONT ones, uh, always document the fault ref because these will always come back to request an appointment be booked for our technicians. Uh, there's no point sending a technician out to look at the physical line in this instance. It's it's a hardware issue on the ONT located in the premises. So um, these uh, we give an appointment straight off for these as there's no point wasting any time through a uh, truck crawl through to the field. Uh, all ONT parallel faults will be open for appointments, so please keep a note with the fault ref and book an appointment when it comes to the appointment request. Uh, if the supplier notes do not include your power troubleshooting invoice in the previous slide, then the fault will be rejected. So it's always, we just need the critical information from you and then we'll send it on. So lossy, we need to know that the patch cable is confirmed and the loss is red. No power, we need to be confirmed that the power switch is in the on position and that the power socket has been checked. So it's, it's once you kind of identify what troubleshooting is needed, it's, it's significantly easier. Uh, troubleshooting serial numbers, so pawn issues. So valid pawn problems would be when the ONT has no loss but a flashing pawn. So this, it's not that the pawn, the serial number can't be uh, confirmed back to the exchange in this instance due to a cable break. It's going to be either a rogue ONT, so it's just not accepting the serial number even if it's correct. It's going to be an incorrect serial number or on the day of delivery, the technician may have mixed up the serial numbers that he placed on ONTA and ONTB. So let's say he's doing uh, deliveries for, you know, uh, Jack and Jill who live next door to each other. So serial number issues be identified by flash upon light in the ONT. If a red loss light is also present, the issue was a loss issue, not an SN issue, and should be treated as such. Customers to confirm the SN from the back of the ONT, and that's very important. Um, if there's an incorrect serial number, and you guys run a sync test and then provide the serial number, from the sink, all that does is pull the, the serial number that's currently on our port. So where we're effectively giving the serial number back to us that we already had. So in that instance, it should always be the serial number for the back of the ONT. Um, always make sure that the customer doesn't give you the model serial number as well. So, you know, the, the, the production serial number. So that's always 4857-5443. As to know, if there's a mismatch in the services down with a flashing pawn, the agent can call the OECC on 1800 656 So our frontline team, my team, this is a quick issue that can be resolved on call. If the sync test returns AFs as the first eight digits, it's a placeholder. So what's after happening here is that when the technician went to add the serial number on the day, there was a software fault failure somewhere along the lines that, he, that wasn't caught. And he's marked the job off and moved on. Uh, yet again, you just grab the steering wheel from the back of the ONT, make sure the ONT is powered on and call into the OECC and we'll update the, the port records for you so that reflects the correct uh, the correct, uh, reflects the correct serial number. And then that'll allow you guys to then return to the customer and TS to make sure everything is correct. Uh, if the serial number matches the sync test, then move forward with a pawn light flashing fault. So if the serial number that you have is the exact same as the serial number that's on your sync test, then what's happening here is it's one of two things. It's either a rogue ONT, so the ONT itself is damaged and won't accept the serial number, or in a very small uh, percentage of issues, it's a splicing issue. So uh, effectively, if you think of splicing issues on FTTH as, for lack of a better term, we'll call them cross ports on DSL. So acceptors, uh, it's, it's, it's a singular customer that's affected, not multiple. So in this instance, the port 1.1 that the customer set on, they're, they're coming back on port 1.2. So I'll never lock onto that instance. I need field tech to either replace the, the ONT if it is an ONT site hardware issue or to resolve the splicing issue. It's a physical network issue. Uh, just a little tip here for you. So all serial numbers start with 4857543443 and the last eight digits are hexadecimal. So zero to nine, A to F. And if the customer provides an SM which doesn't match the first eight digits or provides a character from G onwards, you can instantly confirm the data provided is incorrect and then push back on them and say, listen, um, will you just double check that for me and come back to me with the correct CLI? Uh, troubleshooting, no Mac. 
So no Mac are generally caused either by CPE failure or ONT hardware issues. So we answer the call. Customer asks to confirm what lights are on the ONT. Customer confirms that there is no LAN light present. So I've thrown in this. I know the slides will be sent out just afterwards. So I've just thrown um, this description in here as well, just in case you ever need a quick reference from this slide. So if it's on or blinking, the LAN connection is working. If it's off, the Ethernet connection isn't set up. Uh, Ethernet connection from the modem to the ONT to be checked, ensuring the modem is connected to the ONT via the WAN port. It's the big issue that we see. They get connected into Ethernet ports one through four, and um, it just won't pick up the service. Uh, if correct, the modem is to be ruled out. So if we are seeing an active Ethernet connection, we would always preferential uh, troubleshooting is to try with an alternate non-working modem if possible. However, for an issue that we, we can't guarantee that the modem will resolve, um, and if there's no modem, second modem, and so you can do a loopback test on the current modem to see if uh, the Ethernet ports activate when uh, you, you have them both connected up via the Ethernet cable. Um, if correct, the modems to be real. Though test an alternate modem is preferable, but this can be done via loop by test if no alternate modem is available. Agents then raise the fault as land light off. If any issues arise, the ONT can be powered down to force a dying gasp alarm, and no one not respond and fault code should be used. Uh, the reason for that is, is that sometimes when the hardware fails, it doesn't actually pick up the correct reason for why it failed. So when you try and push that through as land light down, the, the UG does a check in the background and doesn't see a LAN alarm, so then pushes it back. So the way to get around that is you just power down the ONT, you use ONT not responding fault code, which is generally, which can be used based on the dying gas alarm you've just used, and then you just power back up the ONT. Just something to always be careful with there is that if the ONT isn't powered back up, we'll just send it back and say, listen guys, can you power it back on? And uh, let us know when it's done. So if it's powered up, when it comes into the OECC, it stops the reject and it stops somebody having to call back into the OECC center to say it's been powered up. So the journey there is significantly faster for the customer. Uh, so slow speed. So uh, customers call in. Customer identifies that they're experiencing slow speeds. So first of all, the first thing we need to do is identify whether the slow speeds are coming over Wi-Fi or Ethernet. So if it's over Wi-Fi, you guys will have your own routine for troubleshooting it. Um, if it's over Ethernet, you'd be looking towards troubleshooting a network issue. So if the issue was over Wi-Fi, it's not supported by ourselves. And if the issue was over Ethernet, we'll follow the below. So AG confirms that both the Ethernet, that both Ethernets, uh, ONT to the modem and modem to the PC, cables in use are correct quality to process the customer speeds. Uh, we get an awful lot of speed issues in where it's capping between 80 to 100 megs. And this is generally a major indicator that the customer is using a CAF 5 or a lower quality cable. Cable is actually working at 100% throughput, but it can't actually process any speeds higher than that. Uh, another thing that will happen is that the customer will go out and buy a CAT 6 e cable from the modem to the PC, but still uses a lower quality cable from the ONT to the modem. So what that results in is that it's like one single line of tra lane of traffic going into four lanes of traffic. It's still only going to be one lane of traffic, even though it's going in and opening up at that speed. Uh, same way if they have the cables around, it's four lanes of traffic going into one lane of traffic if you just want to take it that way. But uh, both cables need to be up to spec. And it's it's actually the biggest cause of failed slow speed faults that we see um, is, is caused by Ethernet cabling. Um, if either cable is of a lower spec, this will dictate the customer's max speed and will need to be upgraded to a better Ethernet cable. Um, always recommend sending them to a local shop, you know, like a, a proper shop, not a corner shop. Um, we see a lot of people who go down and, you know, an old lady maybe and they get sold, you know, a god awful cable for 10 euro. So it's, it's better to just go into like Dixon's or your PC World or whatever IT shops are closer to them, just make sure they're an IT shop. Um, agent then requests the customer to confirm the throughput of the NIC, so the network interface card that is in their equipment. This will help identify if the customer is being provided a speed profile that is too high for the customer's equipment to handle. So basically, it just helps you realize if you have the customer in a one gigabit profile and they, they have a 500 throughput on their NIC, you know what I mean? There's, their, their equipment's never going to get it. So you can shut down the call quite handily. You can say, listen, you know, unfortunately, your profile is, is twice the speed of what your actual equipment can handle. Um, if all above checks are complete, if all checks, if all, above, if all the above checks are completed and the equipment is correct for the speed profile, a sync test is then run to check the receiving levels at the customer's premises. So our upper and lower thresholds for this are anything within minus 12, minus 25, there's no issues. Perfect results. Then we'll start to kind of see some wiggle room. So between minus 12 and minus 7, the thresholds get steadily worse. And between minus 25 to minus 29, the thresholds get steadily worse. So. The way this works is that whenever we see an issue on FTTH, especially optic related, it's very rarely 
on the higher end. So the higher end in this instance being the minus 12 to minus 7. It's usually always in the lower end of the spectrum being minus, between minus 25 and minus 29. So between minus 25 and 28, it'd be kind of an indicator to, to kind of see if the, the optics cables came out. Maybe you need to reseat them where they dusty, dirty. Um, but anything 29 and over, we'll accept without any issues. If, if for troubleshooting, fantastic troubleshooting, unsure of what the issue is, as long as the, the optics are minus 29 or lower, or uh, we'll accept that straight away. So it's just kind of something to keep an eye on. Anything between minus 12 and minus 25, the speed should be perfect. Anything between minus 25 and minus 29 should be indicating your, uh, your kind of troubleshooting. The closer you get to 29, uh, the more likely it is going to be a network issue. So if you're all out, you're troubleshooting, you're at a last resort, you can contact the OXCC and we'll try to offer you a solution to proof speeds. Um, if a fault returns an RX optic within this range, troubleshooting should now be done on the customer side. Malware, damaged hardware, all PC, et cetera. One thing to watch out for is actually the OPC, especially in elderly customers. What will happen is they will be given, um, you know, maybe an old laptop that the son and the daughter had, or they might be given... Um, you know, an iPad, you know, like a Samsung type touchpad. Um, I used to deal with them on the front line when I was in telephone house all the time. And the, the cause of speeds are that the equipment they have is just old and um, can't actually keep up with today's today's rate of speed. Um, if the RX values are higher or lower than the thresholds, if I was to fall, be accepted, no question. Uh, so Ethernet throughput example table. So I, I, I stole this off a gentleman on Google. Um, I meant to credit him, but. I, I completely forgot to do it. But the reason for this is that we always recommend CAT6 and above cable. So CAT5, our max speed throughput is, is we're going to cap at 100 megs. CAT5 is, we're capping at 1 GB. So theoretically, the, the CAT5 is a grand cable for... So theoretically, the, the cable should work at the, the 1 GBS speeds. But because that's maxing at 1 GB, you know what I mean? So, you know, we, you can't guarantee that the cable is going to work at 100%, 100% of the time. Whereas the CAT6, even if it's not working at 100% of the time, it should be easily able to get to 1 GB speeds because it caps at 10 GB. So that is, that is uh, giving you 10% of the headway rather than trying to use 100% of the headway. Uh, oops, sorry, I stuck my dog. Instinct, no connection. So this is different for white label and non-white label operators. So for non-white label operators, there's not an awful lot of information they can provide. It's it's mainly done on your own side. And then once your own side rules it out, you send a fault through on our SMC team review. Uh, we'll check it for you. White label customers, the majority of it is done in CMS. So what is in sync no connection? In sync no connection is when a customer has active sync but fails to authenticate, resulting in the customer having sync at site, but unable to use the service. And modems will show a red internet light or no internet light, depending on, on the vendor, the, the producer of your modem. Uh, before troubleshooting an in-sync no connection fault, we must rule out a cross-port issue. This is done by simply powering down the modem, running a sync test on the customer CLI. So before we even start looking at anything network related, we just simply power down the modem, run a sync test, and if that line drops, we know we're looking at the correct customer. If the line remains in sync, then we know that we're looking at uh, a different customer's line. It's not actually a core issue or an authentication issue, or there three. It's going to be a physical issue that needs an FST to go back out and write the cables. Uh, if the port drops and the modem is powered down, we're looking at the correct port. If the line remains live and the modem is powered down, we're looking at the cross line. So screening process, yeah, yeah, we've gone through. So this is in sync, no connection for white label. So firstly, we confirm the issue was in sync, no connection, not a cross port fault. Uh, we check that there's no TOS present on the account, and then we inject CMS to ensure that the account is active. If that status is disabled, then you most likely have the customer barred for a billing reason. And um, the customer would need to pay their bill. User would then place a CM order to remove, remove the bar, and customer service will come back up. A uh, customer may have paid the bill, and no CM order was placed. Too. So that's that's something kind of you'd have to follow up with your sales department or your, your orders department, whoever looks after the barren on your side. Uh, we then check the CSID and CMS. So CSID is calling station ID. Um, it's effectively a unique ID for a broadband service to allow them to authenticate back into the network. If the CSID doesn't match uh, on the, the account records and the port exactly, the, the doorman will call it, will say, no, you're not allowed in. And he, you will, we will end up having sync at the premises, but no usage of the actual um, 
no usage of the actual service. Um, so call and station ID over here. And then you verify that against what's on the port. Uh, we ensure the customer is not in an area with an active outage. So via the relevant section of the UG. And uh, you should be checked by following the blow. Uh, that line should have been removed. Outages in the UG, everybody should know how to check them by now. So that's why we had that slide removed. Uh, you just go in and you check your scheduled and unscheduled outages. So uh, scheduled, everybody should be aware of prior to anything happening. So, you know, let's say we're doing an upgrade on the node. Information will be sent out just prior to that. So these can brief your customers or you can expect uh, the influx of calls. Uh, the unscheduled outages are, are the ones that cut us out. So that's, let's say ESB node goes down. Uh, there's no power to our exchange, there's no power to our cabs, and then we're at the mercy of the ESB to bring the power back up to bring it back on. But that would also uh, all be on the dashboard with the start times, updates on what's actually going on in the ticket, and uh, the, the the proposed forecast time for resolution. Uh, one thing to just make clear with the forecast is that they can change. So if the forecast, let's say, is 5 o'clock this evening, we never guarantee 5 o'clock this evening. So, you know, we're hoping to get it done by 5 o'clock, or the initial forecast is uh, five o'clock. We'd never guarantee it because that's it can be pushed out, but it can also be done significantly faster as well. Uh, we reset the modem to make sure it's not a CPA issue or that it's bricked. Uh, if it's bricked, you should know straight away. All of the lights are on it. They're all going crazy. They're flashing. If you run a performance test that has 150 million uh, restarts, that's it's a bit of an exaggeration. But if it's a bricked modem, you could check your your performance test and see you know uh, restarts in the thousands which generally indicates straight away, okay, that's CPA, it's not the network itself. Um, a reset as well, sometimes it just, you can fix this wall config or something's been wrong in the modem. You do a quick reset on it, bang, everything comes back up. So it's just another small troubleshooting step you should do for instant no connection. If after we've done these quick checks though, that it doesn't come back, what we need to do is start using CMS to identify if the customer is authenticating. So the first thing we do is, under our CSID, we have this thing called the authentication lookup. And what this does is this is a table that lets us know if the authentication request is accepted. It's not a request. It's not a radio server which returns the IP. It's solely a table that allows us to know if we're looking at it, uh, if it's being accepted onto the network. So if it does return starting times, reset the modem, check auto lookup CMS, and check for the accepted ticket. So we can see that the example here, the customer came in, he was accepted. So we know it's not a reject here so we can then move on to the next step what we do is we check the radius server so if we see that an access accepted ticket is present then we need to check the radius server so the access present ticket is from the previous screenshot um and so we dig in and we can see so we should see start if we see start and alive tickets and multiple alive tickets then we know that that customer is up and running um, if radius shows it's alive and the customer is authenticating and the agent should revert to customer sites yes um, if either radius or the authentication lookup shows no session requests, then your voice checks have been completed. The agent should raise an instinct no connection fault on DSL faults or an errors on NGA products, ensuring you provide the troubleshooting and you have to confirm that a cross port is ruled out. It's the first thing we look for, so we'll send it back and say, listen, have you ruled out a cross port? Uh, just let us know, and then that allows us to rule it correctly. Um, the reason for that is that when we send it back, you can call us straight away, we can get it updated. Whereas if we send it to the wrong business unit, it could be two to three days before it's identified as the opposite issue. Then it'll be sent back to wholesale, then it might get cleared back to the customer, then you just have to call back in the clarification and then it's pushed out. So um, we always just try to get the clarification before we make any decisions and lock the default into a journey that, that's incorrect. Uh, failure to confirm cross border without screening team, return fault, your leave confirmation. Uh, one more thing to watch for here, if you go into the authentication lookup on CMS and you don't actually have uh, Arnold, they'll all be sent out afterwards and Jay does Q&As at the end, so I'll, I'll deal with uh, them. Uh, da -da -da. Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. So if you go into the auto lookups, the, the, the grey window here, and you don't actually see access accepted, one thing you should always double check is that your modem itself is, is working. Uh, sometimes the modem isn't working, so it won't actually pick up the Mac Mac, uh, the modem's Mac, and if it doesn't pick up the Mac, it won't accept the authentication, and we won't even make it to the radius server. Uh, so in sync, no connection for non-white label. Um, so this is mainly done on your side. There's not a lot I could really advise on here, so I just I try to put a few things together for you. So non-white label OLO is maintained around authentication, and this must be checked on the OLO side. 
uh, non malleable label although should never raise a fault first before ensuring that the issue is not originating from their own side because this can cause um cause issues where we're, we're chasing down an issue that doesn't actually exist and a lot of resources can be used to chase down the issue whereas a simple check prior to raising the fault with your own tier two or own networking teams could, could eliminate that completely you could have it going and um, cross ports and outages should be drilled out first and then raised with the respective networking team to check is your own sentence on your own side um, if your internal team identifies there's no issues on your own side, that's perfect. You have done the checks, you have real out cross ports, you have checked the outages, and because you maintain your own authentication, you've run it by your own teams, uh, you can then move forward with an in no connection fault in BSL and errors fault in NGA to have the open your side checked at that stage. Uh, just make sure that in your supplier notes, on top of confirming that you have checked cross ports, you just need to let us know that you have checked it with your, with your own internal team and that the authentication on your own side looks good. And then we'll accept it and we'll send it out. <laughs> Okay, so failed 